We are thrilled to welcome Matt Hill, founder and CEO of Elogen Bio, to the show today. Thank you once again for joining us. Thanks, Drew. Thanks for having me. Of course. I mean, let's let's kick things off, Matt. So excited you could join us today. Um, just to start and level set here, could you provide a just a brief personal intro with us? Yeah, we'd love to. Um, look, Elogen is around. We have one single mission, which is to make biology programmable. Uh, we're still at the area era of uh, plug board programming in biology. And if we ever hope to realize this vision of synthetic biology that we've been talking about for 15, almost 20 years now, we've really got to increase the length, the speed, the accuracy, the complexity, the throughput of making DNA. It's the only way to unlock this era of programmable bio biology and, and more broadly synthetic biology. That's fantastic, Matt. And before we dive in, I mean, could you just give a brief personal intro on yourself? I mean, we'd love to learn more about you, your background, and just a quick intro there. Yeah, uh, look, my my background is uh, I'm a sort of a reformed diagnostician. Uh, I was uh, the head of uh, R&D over at Natera for a long time and uh, launched a number of products while I was there. And I actually came across this DNA synthesis problem while I was there. Uh, one of the products that one of the platforms that we had created is a massively multiplex PCR reaction involved, uh, for example, up to 40,000 primers all working together in a single tube. And it turns out actually just acquiring that DNA turned out to be a major bottleneck. It usually took us minimally four, often six to eight weeks to get a set of those primers. And that was just a large set of oligos. And this is the 2010, 2011 timeframe. But it, it dawned on me at that time that DNA synthesis had not seen the same sorts of innovation and revolution that we'd seen in the DNA sequencing side, uh, and it still remained a major bottleneck. So when I was ready to found my own company, I left Natera in late 2016 to start a new company at the time. I was very excited about synthetic biology and all the innovations and, and discussion that was taking place in the, in, in, in the, the broader sphere of the life sciences. And you had folks like Church and Endy commenting about this, this grand future that, that is going to happen. Uh, so I was very excited about it, wanted to get into it myself for the company that I was going to form, only to, to then come to the conclusion that the production of DNA itself, which is the choke point, the crux of doing anything in synthetic biology, was actually a key, the key bottleneck. And that problem by itself had to be solved. And so that became the origin of Elgin. I think it's a fantastic origin story, kind of right at that that crux, that moment as Synbio was jumping off the page. And um, I, I think that's so amazing. And so really as a start, you know, you talked about Matt, how you jumped out in 2016. You really founded Elgin and created that out in 2017. I mean, again, like you mentioned, dedicated to solving one is synthetic biology and really just the broader life sciences community's largest bottleneck is around DNA manufacturing. It's such a major issue right now. Um, I, I'd be curious as someone on the ground floor, Matt, someone that was there for the journey that saw the ecosystem was beckoning for this, you know, just taking a step back. Can you just tell us more about the genesis of Elgin? You know, was there a spark or was there a moment, you know, that that really just kicked this off? Like, God, I have to do this. Well, really, the, you know, sort of a deeper dive into that origin story. When you are developing products at a company that and, and, and some of your materials take four to six, eight weeks to build or make or develop, it, it is a supply chain problem. You know, we're at Natera, we are trying to build new diagnostic capability to detect, you know, Down syndrome in an unborn fetus, for example. And the DNA was a crucial input to this process. Now we have any typical company has six to nine months, especially in R&D, you have about six to nine months to show some kind of proof of life of some method or technology to trying to develop to address a particular problem. And if you know you get one or maybe two shots on goal there to get a technology working. And if DNA, which is the crucial input to the functioning of that process or new technology, if that's a key bottleneck, it, it really drives your the, the innovation cycles or the ability for you to innovate at all on just about anything in the life sciences. 
So this was driving our innovation cycles at Natera. And when I left to start Elegen, I realized that this was actually driving, as in DNA synthesis itself, was driving innovation across the industry, or, or, or maybe conversely, the slow speed, the low throughput, the poor or low quality or low accuracy DNA was stifling innovation across the entire life science industry. And so that really was the key thing that I realized had to be solved. And, and you saw it happen. You saw this un, this revolution get unlocked around DNA sequencing and everything that sort of came after, right? With the Illumina's ultra high throughput sequencers and the cost curve and the speed curve, which is often not discussed, right? But it's it wasn't just cost that was driving the sequencing revolution. It was the throughput and the speed and the simplicity with which you could actually interrogate an entire genome for whatever species you might be interested in. It was all those things. So speed, cost, accuracy, simplicity, operational simplicity. You could integrate a DNA sequencer directly into your workflow and use it essentially straight out of the box with a little bit of very routine molecular biology. That does not exist for DNA synthesis and DNA writing. It's a heck of a lot of work to make these longer and longer sequences. And in my opinion, this revolution is going to uh, far outstrip anything you've ever seen in the life sciences before. And that includes the genomics revolution that we saw in the early 2000s. It's wildly fascinating to see you on the cusp of how you're building out this revolution, seeing this kind of next era in a way almost learning from history in a different right, that this is what unlocks and enables new industries and new ecosystems and symbiome. So I think that's fantastic. I would love to dive in here, Matt, and just, just kind of get things going. Um, so to dive just a little bit deeper on some of these questions that you started opening up on the broader problems in the life sciences ecosystem, um, before we just even chat about Elegen's approach, um, if we're going to dive in just for a second here, could you just provide context for our audience and just share more about the difficulties of developing just high speed, efficacious synthetic DNA? I love kind of hearing from your own perspective. Yeah, look, making DNA is a very tough problem. It is this additive and serial manufacturing process. You go from individual nucleotides, which are manufactured somewhere, and you have to first you know, connect those nucleotides into first oligo. And then, you know, typically oligos are, you know, 50 to maybe 200 bases today. And there are new technologies coming online that might get us to four or 500 bases reliably, uh, maybe up to a thousand. But to get to the lengths of DNA that you need to reprogram biology from the ground up, we're talking about multi kilobases minimally. I mean, going from 2,000 to 10,000 to 20,000 to potentially 100,000 over the next few years. That's what's really going to unlock this field, in my opinion. You know, when you can rewrite the genome wholesale, rewrite whole chromosomes, for example, which is where I think this is potentially going. Uh, there are a lot of steps in that manufacturing process. It's not simple. It's not compact. It's not something you can do in a single box. It's actually a series of instruments, a series of different methods, protocols, chemistries that are involved in that process. So, you know, again, serial addition of, of, of bases into oligos, assembling oligos into longer fragments, and you can go longer and longer and longer. Uh, but at some step, you have to purify because errors accumulate through the process. And there are multiple ways those errors can accumulate. Could come from the synthesis step itself, could come from the assembly process multiple errors start to accumulate and you eventually have to purify the DNA out to DNA out to find localize your exact sequence that you were intending to make and that just suggests or implies a very complex manufacturing process it hasn't really evolved much in the decades that we've been doing this so people have been doing DNA synthesis and manufacturing minimally since you know, the early 80s, you know, uh, the, the sort of current generation of oligosynthesis chemistries was developed. Uh, and then, you know, oligo production became reasonably high throughput in the early 90s, and you could get oligos relatively cheaply. 
And then scientists everywhere started stitching those together into longer and longer pieces. A lot of it was very ad hoc with homebrew type methods and they haven't changed much. And we've been doing that purification procedure cloning uh, for almost 50 years, the exact same way. And, and I'm happy to come back to that. I've been wildly fascinated with how Elgin has been addressing some of these challenges through your cell-free workflow. I mean, really leveraging the high accuracy gene synthesis to produce that new class of DNA and FINA DNA is, is really how you all have called it. Uh, but, you know, I just love to start here. I, I love that context, Matt, talking about the history to bring it forward a little bit. You know, could you just tell us more about how Elgin's solution and just how it addresses some of these challenges, how this is kind of bringing this to this next era of DNA synthesis? Yeah, well, the I think the key approach that we take, which I think is very different than a lot of our competitors, is we really take a systems engineering approach to the manufacturing of, of DNA. We, we look and, and interrogate each and every one of the steps involved in the process, and we are not afraid of innovating at multiple steps of that process. So Allergen was not founded on a single core piece of technology that was going to address all the problems. It was founded on this notion that you actually have to solve multiple problems in this process of making DNA, and that we were going to tackle each of those problems by stack ranking those in terms of the impact that they have on being able to produce longer, faster, more accurate DNA, and tick through each and every one of those, solving them in turn. And so one of the first steps of that process that we address is the cloning step. And when you look at cloning, cloning is, as I said, it's a 50 year old process where you take DNA and what you're trying to do is isolate a single molecule and then confirm that that single molecule double-stranded DNA that you have is in fact the one that you wanted to make. And the way we've historically done this is you jam DNA into cells you put them onto agar plates, you move those in and out of incubators, you then pick those colonies and grow them up as cultures, you prep those cultures, and then you can finally take a look at that DNA. Well, we have a much faster cell-free way of doing this. That traditional method doesn't scale well. You can scale it by brute force. You can build a large factory around a bunch of incubators and robotic arms, but it doesn't scale well or efficiently. So it's actually one of the major cost drivers of the whole process and the time drivers of the process. And if you can come up with a different way of approaching this problem, you can make this all very compact, very high throughput and lower the cost and increase the speed and still obtain very, very accurate pieces of DNA. I certainly like that split between kind of the brute force mentality um, and, and hyperscale versus, you know, clean, efficient, right? Uh, and, and, you know, building something unique. So that, that's amazing. And it's just really sounds like from the beginning, elgin has been wary about, you know, the serious bottlenecks that long DNA seeks to resolve in, in scaling, you know, these larger commercial biomanufacturing platforms. Narrowing the focus down a bit further, can we just chat about the moment in the current state right now? You know, what are the current challenges that are really unique within the DNA synthesis field that, I mean, companies are facing really in manufacturing today? Yeah, it's a, it's a matter of scale. It's a matter of accuracy, complexity, length. It's, a, it's really a collection of features that uh, I would argue haven't really changed much in the last Decade. I mean, we are still making, you know, 1,000, 2,000 base DNA. We've been doing this for the better part of a decade commercially. And that, in my opinion, is very slow progress, right? Um, but the, again, the challenge is in order to make improvements on this, you have to make improvements. And when I say improvements, you really got to innovate at multiple steps of that process to get to these longer lengths to simultaneously achieve greater speeds, maintain accuracy or uh, of, you know, uh, of these longer pieces of DNA. And so you are in parallel solving a whole host of technical challenges. Uh, complexity is a key driver. Voice of customer that we hear is everybody wants high complexity DNA. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a bottleneck to the industry that they can't just take some natural sequence, 
rewire or reprogram the biology around it and use a natural sequence, they actually have to modify that sequence, which means it may not perform the fun same function that it was intended to do. So there's a lot of hurdles around making this DNA. And again, with a systems approach, you would you take each and every step of the process and you figure out a solution. And those solutions have to work in sort of a very tightly coupled way so that your sort of inputs from one step match your uh, match the outputs from the previous step. I, I think it's amazing to see how you are addressing a lot of these challenges in lockstep. Um, and really, Matt, to ask the question directly, could you tell us even further, you know, more about how Allogen really plans to address some of these challenges of scale? You know, I think you talked about this brute force method to begin with um, and how kind of the current state is, is set up for a manufacturing platform that might be a little less efficient than it needs to be at the moment, if not way more, obviously. But um, could you maybe discuss, you know, some of these issues of scale and, you know, how Allogen is kind of thinking about that process as you grow? Yeah. Uh, well, I've, I've, I've mentioned the challenges with cloning and what that represents. And, you know, you have to do that sort of at factory scale today. And what Allogen has is sort of bench scale, ultra high throughput, purification of the DNA that yields these NGS verified fragments that we can deliver directly to customers all the way up to 7,000 bases today. Some of the other challenges really relate to complexity, for example, and solving that issue. Uh, and I won't get into necessarily Ele Elegen's exact solution to that problem, but customers want complexity and we have new technical solutions that allow us to achieve much higher complexity DNA than, uh, than uh, what you can get readily today. And we can do that with a highly scalable manufacturing process. And that's really key because sci every scientist everywhere knows uh, who's worked with DNA is actually somewhat used to trying to manipulate or fiddle with DNA to, to get the sequences that they want. But we want to allow the world to just order these things, have them show up in a couple of days so that they can just drop them into their assays and their workflows. And it's the scalability of a process that achieves very high complexity DNA, for example, that has, has been very difficult because we don't want to put an army of PhD scientists who are, you know, over a span of weeks, you know, basically by brute force arriving at this small piece of highly complexity, high complexity DNA, we want to make this widely available so you can order DNA of any length, of any complexity, and get what you need and let scientists focus on the great science and the great products that they're trying to build, as opposed to how to cajole or manipulate DNA into the format that they want. I mean, you certainly have all been on the road towards that in, in a great path. I mean, Elgin has made such an amazing impact since its founding and your product launch in March. Um, now, just in this past May, you and the team have already uh, pressed along your successes, launching a new line um, through your early access program. Uh, the very high complexity DNA and DNA lengths up to 20,000 base pairs. I mean, twice your flagship product and much above the industry leading complexity and turnaround times. I, I think it's been amazing that you are already innovating on your, your new product, your current idea. Um, but really looking back um, at the success you all have had so far from the creation, you know, just taking a step back at the major accomplishments, the successes, the challenges of Elgin, you know, what have been some of the greatest challenges that you've really faced at Elgin yourself, Matt? Yeah, again, I think it comes down to the innovation angle. Um, we have, you know, we were founded on uh, being able to innovate in these very challenging technical areas where I think there was a lot of inertia, first and foremost, but also perhaps a, uh, just a, an acceptance of the status quo. And, and so I and the whole founding group of us at Elgin really have been laser focused on just pushing through some of those key challenges to manufacturing DNA, including the cloning, including the complexity. And we've got other solutions as well. Uh, after you solve this purification, that cloning problem that I mentioned, uh, you know, the, the second biggest portion of the cost of DNA is the oligosynthesis step by itself. And, and that particular step, just for example, uh, if you want to make lots of genes, you've got to make lots of oligos. 
And so you will need a solution that has a very high multiplex production of oligos to feed gene production. And you simultaneously need to do that at a molar scale that makes it easy to feed gene production uh, and at a very, very low cost. And that is hard to do. Uh, there are companies out there that use, for example, inkjet printing. Uh, inkjet printing can work, but it does suffer the challenge of it's very, very tiny quantities of DNA. And so it requires uh, quite a bit of post-processing in order to make that usable. Uh, it's also got the problem of subsetting of the oligos. So you might have an inkjet printer, which makes a million oligos at a time. And you've got to figure out a technology or method for subsetting those oligos into useful groups of oligos that form a gene. We have a solution that actually provides for a smaller, more compact, more cost-effective instrument that makes these oligos that simultaneously has the throughput and the molar scale and the economics that really allow us to produce a lot of genes at a very reasonable cost uh, for the consumer. I mean, I, I think that's fantastic. And on the same vein as you have progressed, I, I just love to know, you know, what have been some of the major accomplishments, the milestones that you have reached thus far with Elgin? Yeah, well, of course, we're very proud of uh, the Infinia launch. And, uh, you know, and that product is already sort of a composite or a combination of industry leading features. You know, it's lengths up to 7KB delivered in seven business days with a customer verified uh, error rate of one in 70,000. I mean, this DNA arrives every molecule that, uh, or every, you know, sequence that a customer might order is NGS verified by us before it arrives at the customer. So they can have a very high reliability in getting the exact sequence they want that they can drop directly in their workflows. And that is enabling, we're seeing that as being enabling for a lot of our customers. Uh, and, and, and so we're extremely proud of that. The team's worked very hard towards that goal. And then as you've already highlighted, you know, we're moving very rapidly into even longer DNA, up to 20,000 bases. Uh, we just launched our early access program, as you highlighted. Uh, we're excited to make that available to customers today and more uh, select customers today. And then more broadly, uh, everyone probably closer to the end of 2023. Uh, and we're laying layering on top of that, this very high complexity DNA so that customers no longer have to make these trade-offs around you know, complexity or speed or length or accuracy. They can just get what they want, place that order, get what they want, drop it directly into their workflows and get that work done. And that's really what they need to do and what they want to do. The, D, the manipulation of the DNA is a means to an end. Uh, nobody really wants to be doing this in their own laboratories. And we want to make their lives simple and let them move faster. And that's how we enable uh, every company in the ecosystem to just go faster and do more. I mean, yeah, the, the, the scale of how you and as a team are, are innovating and growing the, the platform itself, but also just the ease of access for the customer um, for the company that you have built is honestly just fantastic. I mean, huge congratulations to you and the team, Matt. I'm mm -hmm. just excited to see what you think of towards the future and just looking forward. Um, in a way, you know, I, I would just love to take a moment to speculate, look towards the future here, um, the great beyond if you will, in a, in a kind of discussion of how this will really change the space from your own lens. And, you know, as you kind of expand your capability, Matt, from your own perspective, you know, where do you see this space going? You know, what applications get enabled? What gets unlocked? Um, could you share more about what even just this new launch um, gives you and, and the team kind of vision into what will be solved? What will, what barriers will be kind of crossed down? Um in the next few months, in the next few years, you know, what, what's kind of your side or your perspective? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, thank you again. As uh, we appreciate the recognition, uh, the team has been working very hard. Our first step is to just unlock every workflow, let everybody in the field work more efficiently. I've got some ideas about where it's going to go, but I will say, you know, uh, I think the transistor was invented in 1947, uh, roughly. I don't think anyone anticipated what computers would look like, you know, even in the early 70s, let alone today, based on that invention. I think DNA synthesis is in that same category 
of innovation. I think being able to write and reprogram, write DNA and reprogram biology is just the beginning of a, of a new world that is hard to even imagine. It's just incomprehensible, frankly. Where we see this going already is, you know, first of all, every company moves faster. Everybody develops faster. They get more shots on goal. They get more iterations. DNA synthesis goes faster. So your product development looks more like software development. You get many iterations over the same six to nine month window that gets you a higher likelihood of success in the first place. And it actually gets you a better output or, or a better product uh, over that same period of time, because you can take multiple shots on goal. You know, in, in the, the chief challenge in the life sciences is we sort of envision programming biology, but there's another sort of hidden problem. We don't understand the syntax very well. We go to actually write the DNA only to find it doesn't work the way that we thought, right? It, it's not like we deeply, fully, completely understand the nature's programming language. So we're learning as we go. And, and even in traditional programming, iterations are essential. And we wrote those languages. We know exactly how they work and iterations are still crucial. Well, in the life sciences, those iteration, iterations are a hundred times more important because we learn from each iteration more about the biology and how it works. And so the ability to make this DNA allows us to accelerate that process and go from this sort of uh, ponderous, you know, uh, serendipitous approach that we have today to one that's driven and and uh, by more like a software development cycle or an engineering cycle. And that is going to be transformative. Uh, so that's the first thing we unlock and we're very excited and we're already starting to do that. So that's sort of phase one. Uh, the other area where I'm very excited about is we actually start to unlock new applications that folks have never really thought about before or things you can do with DNA that people haven't considered before. Uh, and, and that is, that is coming already. Um, you know, there are ways to accelerate development of therapeutics, for example, that we're already seeing, uh, you know, the ability to make that DNA quickly and accurately allows us potentially to to have a direct patient impact by allowing companies out there which are making vaccines to take our DNA and turn that into a working vaccine with minimal side effects and then get those into patients faster than they could have done using a traditional route. Beyond that, I think it's um, it becomes programming, you know, reprogramming cells. Uh, we're already starting to see this. I mean, you can just think of, um, for example, uh, TCR-based uh, cancer therapies, where you're trying to penetrate that tumor environment and get it and create a strong immune response. We don't know exactly how these TCR therapies uh, work, and 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 therefore you've got to iterate with the you know sort of the control elements that drive some of the response. You've got to iterate on those, and and you can only do that if you can look sort of broad first broadly and get a lot of different sequences and try try out a lot of different combinations and you want to do that quickly and then also iterate quickly. And then in particular with cancer, for example, uh, these uh, some of these up and coming personalized therapies actually require you going from, you know, it's a neoantigen type therapy. So you're going from their sequence of the neoantigens that their tumors are expressing all the way to a engineered TCR therapy that targets those. And you do that with DNA, of course, and you're targeting those neoantigens with new antibodies. And you don't necessarily want to do one, but you might want to do 10 or 20 or 50 to have maximum possible coverage of everything each and every one of those tumor cells might be expressing. And you want to be able to do this when a patient shows up to the clinic and is already stage three or four and uh, is, is not in good shape and you need to be able to deliver a therapy back to that patient extremely fast, you know, a month, weeks to, to a month or so, not six or 12 months down the road. And we saw, for example, with COVID vaccine, the typical 
vaccine development timeframes, therapy development timeframes usually stretch into years, not usually under a year and certainly not in months. So it's a very challenging uh, regime to be working in. And allergen, I think, will play a key role in that because of the speed at which we can produce this very high quality DNA. I love your your lens and the applications that this could reach into, and they're far and wide. I mean, your mRNA program is fantastic. Um, while we're on on this vein, talking about how DNA synthesis is really going to change from an application perspective, kind of as you, as you mentioned within the patient impact cycle, looking into the future with the adoption of Elgin's platform. So think towards, you know, few decades to come, right? Um, I mean, the, the the scale up of high accuracy gene synthesis will really change things, but we'll hopefully see, you know, the cost barriers changing for areas kind of that, as you mentioned, within cell and gene therapies for precision medicine, for point of care systems uh, within oncology or later stage of chronic diseases that need immediate care. We see these cost barriers changing, hopefully, with with the change of Elgin's platform. But when do you personally, from your perspective, kind of see this tipping point happening? Is there a era or is there a, a motion or a, a note to you that says, you know, this would be a, a big change in the system as a tipping point? I think that tipping point's coming much faster than anyone anticipates. Um, we're already in conversations with various customers about how to fundamentally change their methods, their approaches to accelerate their timeline. So it is it is coming very fast. Uh, and as I've said, you know, r- right right now, the beachhead is, uh, you know, the Infinia DNA that we've already launched and the extensions that we're delivering to customers now, they can already get that DNA faster and iterate faster, I think. Therapies are coming next, and and I honestly believe that's probably in the next 12 to 36 months, you're going to see a big sea change in how some of these things are, how we approach some of these opportunities um, and and how we develop these therapies. And then beyond that, I think as, as scientists start to really get comfortable and learn and iterate with that DNA and start to understand the language better and better and better, uh, I think you'll start to see a, a, a sea change around how we approach every problem. It'll be the default to just uh, re-engineer an entire genome to achieve the effect or achieve the output that you you want to accomplish. We'll start to become masters of cell engineering uh, and, and eventually organism level engineering, where we are really designing, um, you know, designing new organisms to do very, very powerful things, whether it's make materials, uh, you know, uh, new therapeutics, um, new chemicals, new compounds, all at a much lower cost uh, and a much faster rate than we ever have before. And that's, you know, you're really harnessing, and it's really all about harnessing the the sort of the 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 compiler that is the cell, right? It takes this DNA code and can read it, understand it, and transform it into products, into outputs. And that's a very powerful notion. And to be able to harness that is really this future of synthetic biology that, uh, Church and Endy and others have been talking about for for decades, and we're just not there yet. But I think as you bring on this capability of arbitrary lengths, arbitrary complexity, very fast uh, turn times, high complexity DNA, um, all at a fair and reasonable cost, that world will open up very quickly. And so we're l- really looking to increase the the scalability and the throughput. Uh, by minimally 100x across these features so that we can have this, have DNA write start to look like DNA read did in the early 2000s. Yeah, I mean, from most folks thought leadership around the future of SynBio and looking at the, the the greats of the industry that have projected and put their own thoughts on what our future could look like. I think it's amazing when you talk about Elgin because you know, not only are you just looking at this could change one vertical, this could change one field, this changes the system of thinking. And that's just wildly fascinating. It's amazing to see that the team is already thinking about how this is changing and innovating. So once again, you know, 
Huge tip of the hat to you and the team, Matt, for what you all have built. As we're kind of still in this projection phase, I'd just love to ask a, a few more questions. You know, as we're kind of looking ahead at this new era, this new field, what new enhancements in DNA synthesis can we kind of just look forward to, even within your own domain? Yeah, I, I think, you know, longer and longer DNA, of course, is is one, uh, you know, making it easy for everybody to, you know, manipulate a genome at the genome scale, right? Um, you know, if we're really projecting out, uh, you know, a handful, you know, a handful of years into the future, it is, uh, you know, just solving the problem of making the DNA. But more broadly, it's actually starting to close the design, build, test, learn loop for customers. I, I don't think every company, every scientist out there needs to be an absolute expert in that cellular engineering the long-term vision for Elegen is to really completely close that design, build, test, learn loop and allow customers to, you know, provide the tools and capability to go through a design phase and pick the right parts and pick the right elements to achieve the effect that they are trying to achieve, have that DNA made, uh, allow them to test and get data that feeds back into that design and iteration cycle. And that's really where this is going you know, right now it's it's baby steps, uh, right? We've got to solve that build phase, which is the the chief bottleneck. Everybody's getting stuck in the build phase for weeks and weeks and weeks, and and it's it's compounded by the fact that because you're stuck in the build phase, you're not learning as much. Your design phase is very limited. You try and simplify the designs that you create as opposed to maximizing the designs that you might create, so that you can get a lot of information. So we want to accelerate that whole loop for customers. Uh, and that's what I think we can look forward to over the coming, you know, five to 10 years is really starting to build out an entire suite of capabilities and tools that will allow customers to go faster and faster and faster. Of course. And thinking more broadly on that specific subject, are there any additional enabling DNA synthesis technologies that you're really excited for? Yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're agnostic to, uh, there, there's no, um, what's the right word? Uh, we try to say unbiased, Right. Uh, you know, we have a very broad, very diverse team with a lot of different skill sets uh, in microfluidics, engineering, uh, chemistry, molecular biology, statistics, software. You know, we've got this collection of awesome team members. And it's really, again, I don't think it's actually driven by any singular technology. I do think You've got to, we, my plan is to continue taking this sort of systems level engineering approach to the problem and always, always, you know, stack ranking these problems, thinking, you know, three to 10 years out around what really starts to move the needle for the community and the scientists doing their great work and then address those problems. And, and as I've said, you know, there is, it's hard to pinpoint any singular technology that solves it all. Um, I think that's often the, you know, it's, it's a pretty common way that I think scientists get trapped is they get fixated on a particular technology. Uh, and our job is to fixate and focus on what are we trying to solve? And then what is the best way to solve that problem? So, you know, we're trying to push the boundaries in terms of complexity while maintaining scalability, this is the other piece. Often when you take a single technology that solves a very specific problem, it has its own individual trade-offs. So the reason the systems engineering approach is so powerful here is that you, you, you look at your collection of solutions that you could use to address a problem. And then for us, it's picking sort of the technical solutions to complexity or the tech, technical solutions to length that simultaneously allow us to scale and bring the cost down at every step. And, and that's what I mean when I say it's a systems, sort of an integrated systems engineering approach. We're not fixated in any given technology. I'm certainly keeping an eye on everything that's coming out and a lot of the work that a lot of other folks in the community are, uh, are doing, but we really work very hard to, to, think, very, uh, to think through the entire system itself and pick and choose the solutions that that give us the combination of length and speed and accuracy and scalability and lower cost at every step of the way. It's amazing to see what Elgin has done to date. 
um, and moving up and discussing, you know, some of the future, some of the plans for Allogen. As we're wrapping up a bit of the, the, the future question here, you know, would love to really just ask what's coming next for Allogen? What can we expect in the next few months? How can our audience follow along on the, on the sidelines and follow the Allogen story? Yeah. As we've already highlighted multiple times, we're constantly pushing the boundaries of our product capabilities. So we've just launched our early access to more complex in DNA, as well as DNA up to 20,000 bases. So if customers are interested in that, they should certainly reach out. Um, you can certainly follow us on our, our LinkedIn, keep an eye on our webpage for updates, uh, but we will continue to push innovative new product features out over the coming, uh, over the coming 12, 24 months. You'll see a continuous progression there. Uh, I think looking into 2024, we should start to see uh, uh, some some additional lengths, uh, possibly some uh, some new features as well. Uh, so I, I encourage people to sort of keep an eye on us and uh, and reach out. Hopefully, we can help solve the problems that you have today with uh, the current Infinia product itself. Super excited for Infinia. Super excited for Elgin, Matt. Um, a few rapid fire closing thoughts. Would would love to. Uh, ask a few rapid fire questions to cap things off before we we close out the episode. Um, and so, Matt, as we're as we're thinking about the future, we know we've projected a lot today. Um, in a, in a rapid fire setting, you know, imagine it's 2050. Uh, could you really describe the DNA synthesis space in a way? What do you see as the as the future as the the far out? Yeah, I, look, I think it's I, I think it's you will it's very Star Trek like in my opinion. I think you'll have or, or maybe every movie that ever shows DNA, uh, you know, it'll be, you know, you'll have a closed loop design and production system where you know you've got a problem, you need to solve it. That solution involves DNA, and then you've got a system that makes that DNA and it is ready and done in minutes or hours, as opposed to even you know, where Elgin is today at a week, uh, we want to make that super, super fast and allow people to engineer genomes. And, you know, we'll start to close the loop around getting that DNA into cells, into the right cells. Uh, I think you'll also at that point have an ecosystem of engineered systems that perform well at various different tasks. And you already see companies starting to think about this, trying to do it, but engineered organisms, which are incredibly good producers or expressors of certain things, of compounds, of proteins, and that'll be a very powerful tool to the industry. Uh, and 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 so I think that'll unlock a lot of additional capability. And so, um, you know, chemical intermediates will be made through biological means. So I think that whole ecosystem will start to evolve as the ability to make the DNA in the first place and then engineer those organisms uh, starts to take on its own and uh, come into its own and, and and really grow out into an ecosystem of capabilities. Still 2050, where's Elgin? Uh, we are a, a, a solution provider for uh, anyone engineering any uh, synthetic biology system, right? Uh, uh, you know, and, and, and we've got inroads into therapeutics and materials and uh, agriculture, which I think is also a very challenging area, uh, which I don't know if the listeners here uh, are, are, are have that uh, proclivity, but ag is a huge space. There's a lot of very interesting things to do there. In fact, you know, a lot of genetic engineering really started in ag. And if you count uh, breeding programs, uh, breeding and agriculture goes back thousands of years with a very concerted and dedicated effort going back 100 years uh, of very specific breeding programs around uh, corn for example. And I think that's an area uh, that uh, that we could really unlock. And plant genomes tend to be very complex and you can do a lot of very interesting things. And, you know, the vision is to make food more available, more readily available, make it easier to grow uh, with less fertilizer, less pesticides. And there's a lot of very interesting things that we can do there. And you've got to unlock the length, the complexity, the speed in order to be able to do that. As we close off the episode, Matt, uh, love the projection here. Love to see where uh, Elgin is going to be in a, in, a, in a few years to come. I'm so excited from your perspective. But as we close off, any closing thoughts, shameless plugs? I'll just say I know everyone's very, uh, we see sometimes skepticism that the DNA could be so fast or so accurate. And so I encourage everyone to just try it. 
you know, we we're happy to show you data, but a lot of a lot of scientists want to get get their hands on it. So I encourage you to just try Elegen. Feel free to verify it. Uh, we stand behind our claims. Uh, I know there's a lot of really aggressive claims out there in terms of you know for marketing purposes, but you will be you will find yourself very pleasantly surprised at our capability and what we're able to do. But it takes customers have to take the first step and actually order order the DNA and see for themselves. Thank you once again, Matt. I think it's a fantastic way to close out the episode. Thank you once again for joining us. We're super excited and super gracious to your time. Thanks, Matt. Thanks so much, Drew. Appreciate it.